Public Accounts Committee and Northern Ireland Assembly, um, and we're now in public session. Members' mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via live online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one is apologies. I think we have a full house today and there are no apologies. Um, agenda item two then. Minutes of the 11th of February 2021, which are pages 6 to 11 of your pack. The minutes of the meeting of the 11th of February are in the pack and there is a slight amendment to, at agenda item nine when recording the Northern Ireland Audit Office reports, which uh, underline then to keep and release. And considering the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, the Social Investment Fund was, uh, vote was taken, three to keep, five to release. This is now recorded in the minutes. Are members content? Yeah. Your permission to sign yeah. the minutes? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> moving on then, um, uh, moving on to agenda item three is the declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register the relevant financial and other interests in the register of members' interests. Do any members have any interests they wish to declare this afternoon? Okay. Agenda item four, then. Uh, matters arising. Um, table pack pages three to 19. At last week's meeting, we noted correspondence from Mr. Edward Cook regarding the relocation of 800 students from Belfast to McGee campus in Londonderry. Members agreed to write to the University, sorry, the Ulster University, seeking clarification on the issues raised and a draft has been prepared for the committee's consideration. Uh, this is in your table pack at page 19. Uh, are members content or do members have any comments or amendments to the letter that they would like to uh, register now and the clerk will take note? Are members content with the letter? Content. Everyone's content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I refer to correspondence received from Mr. Edward Cook dated the 12th, 15th, 16th, 17th of February 2021 in your table pack, pages 3 to 18. Are members content to note? No. Members no. content to note? Yeah. No. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, broadcasting, can I ask you then to bring in Mr. Kyle Bingham, Northern Ireland Audit Office's Assembly Support Officer. Mr. Bingham, can he, are you here? Can you hear and see me? Not yet. Um, can I ask Broadcasting to bring Mr Bingham into the meeting via Spotlight, please? Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Ah, good afternoon, Kyle. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, okay, Kyle, so w what we need you to do is, um, um, having established you can see and hear me, um, you're in spotlight, but if you wish to speak, you need to unmute yourself, okay? Uh, agenda yes. five, then, is correspondence at pages 16 to 22 of your pack. And at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, Northern Ireland Audit Office, uh, uh, Mr. Kyle Bingham, uh, Assembly Support Officer, and Ms. Colette Keen to the meeting. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Afternoon, Members, I refer to correspondence from Mr. Trevor McKee, dated the 12th of February 2021, at pages 16 to 22 of your pack, regarding a review of the uh, CCNI, which includes correspondence dated the 9th of February 2021 from Ms. Nicole Lapping. The uh, Chief Commissioner of the CCNI, CCNI has now forwarded to Mr. McKee the terms of reference for the review by independent counsel. Ms. Lapping has also invited Mr. McKee to contact the Review Council if he would like to participate by meeting with the Independent Council to outline his concerns. Um, members, are you content that we forward this letter to the Northern Ireland Road Office and inform Mr. McKee of this action? As discussed last week, the Comptroller and Order General is keeping the matter under review. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, members, I refer to a memo dated the 12th of February 2021 from the clerk for the Finance Committee. 
and, and tabled in your pack pages 21 to 24. The Finance Committee noted that members relating to the PAC report on land, wave <coughs> and digital transformation are still under consideration and have therefore agreed to forward correspondence from Mr Paul Murnahan, Regional Director of, um, uh, of BTNI Enterprises to the Public Accounts Committee. Members, in your table of pa uh, pack, pages 25 to 26, is a draft response uh, to Mr Paul Murnahan outlining the inquiry process and how the committee forms its opinions. Are members content with the draft response? Any changes or amendments that members want to make? Suggestions? If not, members are content? Great. Great, thank you. Okay, members, we continue in open session. Uh, we are agenda item six. Uh, two ministerial directions this afternoon. Acknowledgement. One, acknowledgement <coughs> payments to students and two, a bonus scheme for health and social care uh, workers at pages 24 to 29. And at this stage, I would invite Mr Kieran Donnelly, the Controller and Auditor General, and Mr Kelly Bingham, Assembly Sport, um, to um, join the meeting. I refer to the correspondence dated the 15th of February 2021 at pages 24 to 30 of your pack, outlining two ministerial directions in respect of acknowledgement of payments to students and bonus scheme for healthcare workers on certain healthcare programmes. Members in your pack, page 25, correspondence from the Department of Health Permanent Secretary dated the, the 4th of February 2021, outlining the ministerial directions, uh, acknowledgement payments to students and bonus scheme for health and social care staff. The acknowledgement payments of £2,000 will be made to healthcare students who have undertaken clinical placements in the health and HSC during the pandemic. It is estimated that more than 3,800 students will be eligible and that the cost is projected to be in the region of £7.7 .7 million to Northern Ireland Executive and payment will be received by May 2021. The bonus scheme set up to value of £500 per individual uh, to be made to health and care uh, social care staff. The payment will be paid pro rata to all staff who have one month's employment across the, the, the relevant period, i.e. from the 17th of March 2020 to the 31st of January 2021. A broad range of staff and cares are eligible. Members, uh, based on the NISRA figures, there are 132 uh, jobs in the wider health and care social care system that are eligible. As such, the Department has estimated the costs of £60 million for staff employed by HSC and the independent care home sectors and £71 million for other staff groups such as GPs and dentists. The Department estimates that the bonus payments will be received early in the new financial year. Uh, members, also in your pack at pages 27 to 30 is the relevant correspondence from the Minister of Health to the 17th of January and the 25th of January 2021, and the briefing paper for two separate ministerial directions. Mr Donnelly, good afternoon. Do you have any comments you wish to make? Uh, Chair, I think you've covered all the, the main points there. Um, well, the bonus scheme is uh, £500 for each member. So it's the share scale of the health service workforce, 132,000 people. And it's the wider health service. And, you know, it'll cover the care sector as well. Uh, I think all staff are included, apart from non-executives, anybody that has been dismissed for misconduct or anybody in a career break. Uh, so it's uh, that's why the, the figure, the 131, is so big. It's just it's covering a very big workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one's much smaller in money terms um, for um, students and pre reg here. I think the cost of that is 7.7. .7. In both schemes, um, the accounting officer is really saying it's not possible to construct an adequate business case to support the payments. So okay. I don't I have nothing more really to say on it than that. Okay. Mr. Hildage. <coughs> Chair, I think we actually welcome this coming before us today, but I think the important bit in it is the pro rata payments, which should help. I think there's been problems in the past where some monies have been paid out due to the pandemic, and um, it has been a bit unfair where just it's a lump payment, you either qualify for it or you don't. I think the inclusion of pro rata has been very useful, very helpful. Yeah. Any other members, any comments? Chair. Sure. So, Mr Muir, is that you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll declare uh, a conflict in this because of it, um, our declaration of interest uh, because it affects my uh, mum uh, if he falls into the category of eligibility. Uh, ju just one question. Um, obviously, there's more and more of these ministerial directions coming th through. 
has there been that central depository of where they all, uh, you know, of all the ministerial directions made? Has that been published yet? I just wanted to check if that has happened. It hasn't happened yet, Chair, but um, the Permanent Secretary of DOF is agreeable to to do that. So it's just a question of, of implementation. So we'll check up on that. Uh, there's been, I think every week here, there's been, <clears throat> been a couple. So there's been more through the COVID period than there's probably been since this over the past 20 years. So there, there are yeah. a lot of them. Well, would it be, for example, we would, you would do them for the end of the financial year or something? Would that be something you would? Uh, well, uh, uh, Sue Gray has actually agreed that this should be published as you go, right. that you yeah. wouldn't wait to the end of the financial year. So uh, the idea would be to put them on a website. So uh, it's just a question of implementation, I think, on that. I'll liaise further with Department of Finance and we'll see how that is progressing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other member? Mr. Beggs? Uh, I think it has been an extremely stressful time for anybody working within the healthcare sector not only uh, our own trust staff, but uh, I'm glad that it's went wider, uh, supporting those who've been working in the, the, the care uh, uh, homes, etc. Um, and then with regard to the, um, the students who are getting the higher payment, um, my understanding is that they were working full-time unpaid as part of their placement, uh, uh, which is required to get their full qualification. So I think it is valid that they should be recognised for that full-time effort at a critical time in our health system. Any other member? Anyone content? Can I just ask, Chair, if I may, thank you. Um, uh, this is a slightly, uh, I guess, forward-leading question, but has the, just because this is what, this bonus payment, which I um, support, uh, echo what Roy just said about it, um, but is the NA, is the other office ready or have you had any informal communications that you're going to get more ministerial directions very quickly in the next few weeks, given the volume of underspend and the likelihood that some of that expenditure, as with this, agreed at short notice, will, will require a direction? Um, all I can say, Chair, I've no advance notice of any more that are coming. It's not to say that uh, I wouldn't usually get advance notice. They, they usually just arrive. Uh, sometimes if there's one that is maybe a little bit contentious, uh, you know, a department might have a conversation with me. But um, on these one, you know, they're, they're coming in as a, a matter of routine almost. Okay. Well, if everyone's content. I just say that I echo the, the, the words of members. is a welcome decision by the executive, and I, I think the... Um, those working in the NHS across Northern Ireland in the health and social care sectors and indeed those uh, working in the private sector who are eligible for this uh, are very worthy of it and we thank them for the huge contribution that they and the students who are also going to receive uh, some extra support uh, for all that they have done through the most difficult of circumstances uh, across the country and uh, we'll simply move on at that point. Thank you. Um, members, we will remain in open session for evidence on the fifth inquiry, our inquiry into Driver and Vehicle Agency 2019-20. Broadcasting, can I ask you at this stage to please bring in Ms Katrina Godfrey, the uh, County Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure, and Mr Jeremy Logan from the Department, and Mr Stuart Stevenson from the TOA. Um, also broadcasting, can I ask you to bring in Ms Suzanne Murphy, Audit Manager, and Ms Caroline Laird, Auditor and Mr. Kyle Bingham is already in the meeting. Um, Mr. Murphy, Ms. Laird, Mr. Godfrey, and Mr. Logan, can you see and hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay, it's Mr. Murphy, yeah, okay. Any of the others joining us yet? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay, and Mr. Logan and Ms. Godfrey, have they joined us yet? Okay, broadcasting, we can seem you, to have a problem with can, the... Can you hear me, Chair? Sorry, is that Mr Logan? Yep. It is indeed, yes. Logan, okay. Um, we, we're just trying to establish a connection with Katrina Godfrey. Can you hear us, Katrina? Uh, 
Hello, can Katrina Godfrey hear us okay? You, you seem to be on mute. Maybe if you could just... We, we can't, we can see you okay, Katrina, but we can't hear you. Somebody else, there will be else on you. I don't know. Oh, just my head. We still broadcasting, we still can cannot hear um, Katrina Godfrey. We can see her, but we can't hear her, and obviously, that's crucial to the, the session continuing. Sure. Um, broadcasting is saying she will need that um, she needs to change her microphone settings. By the sound. Okay, um, Katrina, we're being told by broadcasting you need to change your microphone settings. If you can do that, please. Uh. And I'm getting another message. I'm just waiting for it to come through. It just proves it's a live show. <laughs> If this doesn't work, um, it might be best that she leave and rejoin, but we'll see how it goes. <coughs> can she hear us? I think she can because she was trying to speak. What's that to say? Hello, Katrina, can you hear us okay? Broadcasting, you're suggesting what you, you might better do is leave and, and rejoin if you can do that. Thank you. Okay, we'll suspend, suspend the meeting until we uh, manage to establish a link both visually and uh, audibly with uh, the Permanent Secretary. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, order. Um, I uh, bring the uh, meeting back to order and we are in open session. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by Ms. Katrina Godfrey, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Executive Department for Infrastructure, Mr. Jeremy Logan, the Chief Executive of the Driver and Vehicle Agency, uh, who are joining the meeting remotely. And also in attendance is the Controller and Auditor General, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, Ms. Colette Kane, and Mr. Stuart Stevenson of the TOA. Um, okay, members, I refer to your papers in the pack for the evidence session. The Northern Ireland Audit Office report in the Driver Vehicle Agency 2019-20 at pages 32 to 38 of your pack. The biographies for Ms. Katrina Godfrey, the Accounting Officer, DFI, and Mr. Jeremy Logan. Uh, are in your pack at pages 39 and restricted briefing paper from the Northern Ireland Audit Office and restricted paper on suggested questionings if members need those are pages 40 to 54. Uh, I welcome Ms Godfrey and Mr Logan to the meeting in the evidence session and uh, good afternoon to you both. If you would like to make a statement to the committee, uh, please do so um, and then we will ask members uh, to ask questions. Hi, thank you very much, Chair, and, and first of all, apologies. Needless to say, the Starleaf test yesterday went perfectly with no hitches whatsoever, and today it wasn't quite the same, but I've managed to get in on my iPad as opposed to my work laptop, and hopefully the battery will hold up um, for the duration of the session. Um, I'm very conscious, Chair, that the advice of the Business Committee is that opening remarks should be kept very, very brief, so beyond uh, making a couple of points, I, I won't detain members too long. Um, we're very happy to have the opportunity to answer the committee's questions on the CNAG's report looking at the results of his audit of the agency's 2019 accounts. Um, I imagine we will spend some time on the aspects of the report that deal with the circumstances that required the agency to suspend services following the identification of faults in the lifts that it uses. And I just want to say at the outset, from the department's perspective, the decision to spend those services was actually a very straightforward one, given the priority that we insist the agency attaches to health and safety. However, the reality was that it caused widespread disruption to motorists and indeed to staff. And I am very sorry that so many people were inconvenienced as a result of that decision. Of course, at that point last January, we didn't know then that, that disruption would be eclipsed by the disruption caused by COVID-19. But it's worth going back to the events of January 2020 um, and just very briefly, Chair, saying a little bit about the approach that we took, which really can be summed up in four steps that have been so very important both for my minister and for me as principal accounting officer. First of all, we wanted to understand why this had happened and particularly why it had happened without prior warning. And that was very much the key purpose of the two investigation reports that we commissioned. Secondly, we wanted to fix the situation, to work with the agency to get vehicle testing services back up and running safely as quickly as possible. The third area of focus was the focus on preventing recurrence, so implementation of all of the recommendations from both investigation reports and very close monitoring of progress. And then for me particularly, the, the fourth area of focus was the need to learn from the situation and the events surrounding it. And actually to learn not just within the agency, but across the wider department as well. Chair, if you're content, I'll not say any more at this stage, but I'll ask Jeremy to add some opening remarks of his own and then we can move into questions. Yeah, just before Mr Logan comes in, could I ask everyone, apart from those people speaking who are joining the meeting remotely, to uh, mute themselves, please? There's some background noise. Uh, which has obviously been interfering with the contribution that uh, Ms. Godfrey has just made. Okay, Mr. Logan. 
Chair, I would just like to reiterate Katrina's earlier comments and apologise to our customers for the disruption caused by the suspension of the vehicle lifts from the 27th of January. This was clearly not foreseen and due to the fast moving nature of events, there was little we could do to mitigate against the impact when it was clear the rolling programme of repairs would not address the faults identified on most of our lifts. I want to assure the committee that throughout the events that unfolded in January 2020, that the health and safety of our staff and our customers was paramount. I welcome the independent reports commissioned by the Minister and the Permanent Secretary and their findings presented the agency with an opportunity to learn lessons and strengthen internal controls. The reports identified a number of actions and arrangements that needed to be put in place to minimise a recurrence of such events and we moved quickly to develop a comprehensive action plan to address these findings and recommendations. The first action plan progress report reflected the progress of the 31st of May, by which time a number of actions had already been completed. Since then, I have provided the Minister and the Permanent Secretary with a monthly update on progress, publishing quarterly reports on the Department's website. The implementation of the action plan is being monitored by the DVA's Audit and Risk Committee, and the validation of actions has been included in the DVA Internal Audit Plan for 2021. We are well on our way to completing the identified actions, and while it has been a very challenging experience for our customers and staff alike, I am confident that when the action plan is implemented in full, it will address the concerns and recommendations from both the audit and the engineering reports. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Can I just ask, before we bring members in, um, what is the projected uh, number of lifts that your lifts are uh, expected to make per year? The lifts that were at fault? We estimate, um, based on the, the information that was provided, that our lifts would probably um, complete around 20,000 20, lift cycles every year. Um, we have test centres at 50 locations, and those test centres are, are very busy. Uh, and probably these lifts would be used, you know, um, you know, regularly uh, across all the test centres in, in a fairly vigorous way. Um, so uh, approximately 20,000 cycles per year would be the, the expectancy across the network, although there'd be variations between some centres. So, so what is the lifespan of, of the lifts that you installed? The new lifts that we installed? No, no, the lifts that were at fault. What's the, what was their lifespan? We, at that stage, had not um, identified uh, an absolute lifespan. Uh, there was uh, a rigorous uh, plan preventative maintenance regime in place. And the discussion around lift cycles not really only started to recur once we started to talk about uh, the impact and the aftermath of the event. Um, similarly, those lifts are designed, and I think the EU standard is for 22,000 lift cycles, but that is a very minimum figure. And indeed, in discussions since then with Maha, they say that you know these lifts could last anywhere between five and 25 years, depending on their usage. And uh, you know that is based on a the vehicle lifts are sorry, 4. Sorry, point. That, so you broke up there. That's based on what? That's based on a maximum load capacity. So the vehicle lifts are designed to lift 4.2 tonnes. And the vast majority of the, the lift cycles that we would conduct during a year would be much less than that. I, I would estimate probably about a quarter of that lifting capacity. So that would naturally extend their useful life. But, but, but how do we get to... Surely, surely in terms of maintenance and writing off this equipment over a, a number of years as any business would, whether five, ten years or whatever, the lifespan is crucial to that. And not to know the lifespan... Um, I mean, for example, could we have had a situation... Did we have a situation where we had some lifts that were carrying out um, more than 20,000 lifts per annum... Uh, for an interminable number of years that we didn't know. I mean, were, were these sort of uh, is, is are there computer records for these li these lifts of how many cars were going in? You know, if we if we had lifts that were carrying twenty thousand lifts a year, and doing that over, um, I think they were installed in 2011, 2011, were they or when were they installed? Yeah, they were installed between 2011 and 2013, and we don't have actual um, lift cycle counts for each lift, and it is one of the actions that we're taking forward. And indeed, in the terms of the new lifts, they have all been installed with uh, cycle counters. So that definitely is one of the lessons learned from the engineering and audit reports. So, so um, the figures that I have provided are estimates based on the uh, amount of vehicles that we test each year. 
So these were these these lifts, the lifts that have been replaced were bought from the lifts that have been replaced have been bought from Maha, the contractor that supplied the, the, the lifts um, where the feelings were identified, yes. Okay, and were they also the people who were contracted to maintain the lifts? That's correct. And did they not know exactly how many lifts you should have per annum and the lifespan of a lift and so on from their experience in other countries? They would, did not define a specific um, lift usage. As, uh, they, in speaking to their managing director, I mean, lifts could be designed to, to last between five and 25 years, depending on, on the usage and the load cycles that they're lifting. So uh, to be absolutely definitive about it, it is very difficult to say that that lift will last you know, five, six years. What we were re relying on was the MAHA and the expertise that they provided in uh, the planned uh, preventative maintenance schedule and indeed the, um, the condition reports they completed on those lifts in October 2018 to say that the lifts were still in good working order. And we were trying to obviously maximise the use of those lifts, but uh, ensuring that our eight weekly inspections and our six monthly insurance inspections were still being conducted in a very rigorous way. And there was nothing at those inspections that would have indicated that those lifts had reached their end of life until the first signs of the cracks appeared in uh, November 2019, which really brought to our attention to the potential issue that unfolded in January. Yeah, and and so we get we get, and I'm sure members will bring this up. We sixth of November, crack identified in two lifts in Larne. Then you had carried out um, some uh, repairs to that. And then we have um, a survey, and of these lifts that are potentially going to last between five and 25 years. When the survey is conducted in January, and uh, 50, 51 out of 55 are deemed to be faulty, for lifts that could, live, could, could work between 5 and 25 years, 51 out of 55 are faulty. Uh, that's a very high ratio for lifts that are inspected on an eight-weekly basis, Mr. Mr. Logan. Yes, I mean, the, the, it, it, it took us all by surprise. It took the agency and certainly uh, Maha, the contract, contractor, by surprise, because you're, you're absolutely right. Those lifts have been inspected rigorously um, through a regime uh, every eight weeks. Mr. Mr. Logan, the Mr. Logan, the crack... Mr. Logan, I would contest it should not have taken anyone by surprise, least of all Maha, who are inspecting these on an eight-weekly basis. There should have been no surprises. Because if... Well, they, if, uh, if if the if the inspections were being carried out in the in the the, the regular way they, they should and I imagine were were, how could there be fifty five fifty one faults out of fifty five when those checks were being carried out on a regular basis? There should be it's not acceptable that there were surprises. I would put to you. When the crack was identified in the first lifts in Larne, these are very small hairline cracks that um, the nature, obviously, of a, of, a, of a working environment such as DBA's test centres, um, you know, these, um, you know, in around the pivot boss where the cracks were, um, there's grease and there's, um, you know, oil and, and that type of thing that could have concealed uh, the signs of these earlier um, hairline cracks. I think what had happened then is it drew the attention of the examiners much closer to this and the concerns of the tests and the uh, equipment that was inspected thereafter. They were looking at this same lo location to see if there was any further signs across the network of lifts, uh, which unfortunately there were. And then obviously uh, we called Maha and asked for a thorough examination of all the lifts when it came back that 51 of the 55 lifts indeed exhibited this sign, these signs of cracks, uh, which we um, tried our best to, um, in conjunction with Maha, continue to provide a, a rolling programme of repairs, which unfortunately proved unsuccessful, uh, resulting in the suspension of the lifts at the, at the end of January. Yep, and I'll finish for the waiting time with this, this point. Um, in terms of the, the inspections that Maha would carry out, Surely they're not carrying out inspections on an eight-weekly basis uh, using the, the naked eye. Surely they're using uh, proper professional equipment that allows uh, these, these cracks to be identified as being more than just surface cracks and actually being structural cracks. Surely a lay person like me and the person carrying out these inspections do not have the same equipment. 
the the eight weekly inspections and the cracks were identified through the thorough examinations and they were conducted you know in line with the the Lawler regulations the lifting operation and lifting equipment regulations and that was uh, completed by the competent authority uh, you know a, a structural engineer um, so the reality is that that is the the, the inspection re regime that was put in place and that's where these uh, um, cracks were identified uh, and I think you know you or I, you know, um, would not necessarily have picked those up, but it was picked up by by that thorough examination regime. And was that was that competent authority a a member of the Maha staff? They subcontracted the insurance inspections to an outside body, um, but that was under their their own contract, and that has subsequently been removed. And DBA have now taken control of that independent insurance. Um, contract and they report directly to us um, uh, going forward. Again, another lesson learned from the uh, the reports that were published. Does that suggest that, the, that their own people weren't competent to have the subcontracted out? It, it suggests that um, they, they uh, had that, that independency, I suppose, brought by an independent company coming in to check their lifts uh, was a key component of the plan preventative maintenance regime. And it's one that we have continued with, albeit it is reporting back directly to the agency now, as opposed to Maha. But it did take 50, 51 lifts out of action out of 55. I think that says it all, Mr. Harvey. Okay. Chair, is it, is it possible for me just to add something before? Yes, of course. Yes, 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 of course. Um, and just really, because you've asked um, many of the questions that we've asked ourselves, and um, one of the contextual factors that I know is picked up in the Controller and Auditor General's report is the, the, the element of surprise. But it's, it's also maybe worth noting that um, these lifts are in use in other jurisdictions. Um, one of the things that the agency did to its credit was to share the information with other jurisdictions as soon as it found itself in this position. That actually gave, that was the thing that gave rise to the discovery of a similar problem um, in the South. So it was the agency contacting its colleagues in other jurisdictions saying, we've had these issues being told, oh dear, no, we don't. And then actually those colleagues going to look and discovering they had a similar problem. So, you know, I just add that by way of additional context. Well, that's good. But this, this committee is charged to look at the, the, the body that's responsible for Northern Ireland. And that's what we're Absolutely. looking at. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and I think we need to remain focused on that. Uh, Mr. Harvey. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. And Mrs. Godfrey, Mr. Logan, good to see you. I'm gonna start at the beginning. You say scissor lifts are fundamental in MOT testing, and my question would be, from the inception of the MOT testing in Northern Ireland, which was probably back in the 70s, there were no scissor lifts until probably 2010. What was the reason of changing your methods of testing from pit to lift? If we can just start with that. It's, it's a good question, uh, Mr. Harvey, and to be honest, uh, I'm not sure at which point in time we tr transitioned to the lifts. Um, I suspect that the nature of that was probably about the efficiency of the testing process uh, and being able to maximise our capacity at our test centres. And there was also um, potentially issues around using the pits in terms of some, some health and safety considerations um, um, for, for our staff, um, you know, continuously looking at the underside of vehicles. Um, whereas the lift uh, allows the vehicle to be inspected in a much more conducive uh, health and safety manner for our staff. But I, I couldn't give you a definitive response about why that was changed, but that would be my uh, suggestions around the, the capacity and health and safety considerations I would imagine have come into play in that, that decision making. Yeah, yeah. I find it difficult to understand that in 2018, as the Chair said, lifts were all in perfect working condition and then like out of the blue, cracks start appearing in 2019, obviously because they were well past um, their, their lift capacity. When you decided to weld the cracks, who recommended or approved this action and why was it not a success? I think we were very keen on trying to maintain service delivery as well as ensuring that what we were delivering was uh, safe for our customers and our staff. And in consultation with Maha, uh, we agreed a rolling program of repairs um, where there's cracks to get uh, to get those welded to see if that would indeed address some of the concern and at least uh, buy us a little bit more time to consider a longer uh, replacement program. Uh, unfortunately, 
that uh, repair programme was rolled out in January and didn't prove effective uh, in terms of addressing the cracks. Okay. Have any lifts ever collapsed because of the cracks? No, not to the best of my knowledge. There was no lifts that collapsed as part of, of, of this uh, particular incident, no. Okay. And rather than replace the entire lift, was consideration given to replacing the item that was at fault? Surely it was only one part rather than, you know, a complete lift? I think it was considered in the White Young Green report, and uh, there was uh, consideration of replacing the scissor arms and the pivot bushes themselves yeah. and the pivot boss, but um, it was such a significant piece of work. And bearing in mind you would have been replacing uh, key components on lifts that were already sort of eight or nine years old, we didn't believe that that was necessarily the best uh, course of action mm -hmm. and would have still caused significant disruption because uh, uh, those vehicles would have, our lifts would have had to be taken out of commission and potentially more disruptive than replacing. And when your lifts were removed, were they all scrapped and certified as scrapped being so, or were they sold? I don't honestly know the, the answer to that question. I don't believe that they were sold, and I imagine that they were scrapped. And I can certainly confirm that and come back to the company to let, to let you know. But no, I don't think that they were sold on uh, because of the nature of the, uh, the, the, the fatigue on the metal. Yeah, just because of the safety issues that have been safe for if they've been scrapped and certified as done yep. so. Just to finish, during COVID and when most centres closed at times, um, has this given your management team time to think how things are done and have you planned any improvements? And just thinking your plans for diesel cars emissions and stuff going forward. I know you have a new test centre coming that's capable of doing this, but what about the rest of the test centres and testing the diesel emissions? Thank you. In its respect, in terms of COVID, COVID probably hasn't given us any time at all. Um, really, since March, um, the impact of COVID has been very hard felt across the agency with uh, vehicle testing and driving tests and, and other services, including driving licensing. So it has been a particularly difficult time for, for staff to try and manage the circumstances and try and recover our services as quickly yeah. as we possibly and safely as we could in line with the public health advice and guidance. Um, certainly, you're, you're absolutely right. We want to progress with um, our proposals to enhance and modify the network. And it was good that within COVID, we managed to get the Hyde Bank contract awarded. And, and that uh, contract is now started on site with the completion date of the test centre and the new depot um, for September 2022. But yes, we've also been liaising with the Minister with regard to proposals for the wider network. And um, you know we would hope that the minister will be in a position to make uh, an announcement and proposals going forward. Uh, you know. Yep, yep, that's good. No, that's all the questions. Unless Ms. Godfrey would like to add anything on again. Thank you. I just to pick up on that last point um, and um, to reflect what Jeremy has said that certainly the, the policy direction and the, the future um, footprint of um, test centres is something that is under consideration within the department, uh, having had its recommendations from the agency and the minister is looking at, at those propositions now and I imagine she'll be in a position in the not too distant future to say something. Okay, thank you both very much and your team. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr Muir. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for the officials for attending today. Um, the key concern, first and foremost, around all of this is health and safety, and it would be the health and safety of workers and also people using the test centres. Um, and around that, I just wanted to know, was there ever any concerns raised by staff uh, prior to the what became public around the whole issue? Uh, around the standard of the lifts and concerns around the safety of those and what were those concerns uh, raised? I think certainly when um, the issues with the lifts were uh, and the cracks were appearing in lifts across the test centre network, yes, there was naturally concerns with the centre uh, management and, and the, the staff uh, that these lifts were safe to operate and that was a, one of the key fundamental um, positions we took that if they were doing repairs that uh, the lifts were not uh, commissioned until they've been thoroughly examined again before they could be put, put back into use. Um, so throughout um, throughout January indeed when the repairs were being conducted, lifts were decommissioned uh, until the repairs had been effected and one of the key things was that the insurance inspector went back to sign those off 
uh, as safe to operate. And I suppose ultimately, as we got through um, January and to, to the 27th of January, when the decision was finally taken, the reality was that they could no longer assure us that these um, uh, that this uh, you know lifts across the network were safe to operate, and ultimately we had to take the decision then to suspend all lifts from that point forward, which we know caused significant disruption. Uh, thank you. And just looking back on this, um, you know, there's a, a media report from the 23rd of January that NIPSA were aware of ongoing health and safety concerns around the safe operation of the lifts, and that there was concerns of staff around the quality of the welding work in terms of the repairs. Uh, were you aware of those concerns being highlighted to yourselves? And you, was there, why was there no decision taken to, to intervene in terms of the continued operation of these lifts? Well, with regard to the welding repairs, yes, we were aware that there was some concerns with the quality of the welding repairs, and that was picked up by the insurance investigator, as I understand, or the, 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 through the thorough examinations. And that's really what brought it to the head in around that period of time. And also the health and safety executive were involved and we were consulting with them about, you know, we would not put a lift into service where we had concerns that the repairs had not been affected adequately. Um, so until they had been examined again uh, and that thorough examination had been completed and signed off, those lifts were not used. And, uh, you know, that was the stance that we adopted throughout. Yeah. But it is fair to say that there were staff concerns uh, naturally because it affected a number of lifts. Yeah. One of the key issues, I think, from my own personal perspective that led to this was the inspection regime um, and the fact that the inspections were carried out by the supplier, albeit subcontracted, was that not considered to be also a health and safety risk? Because essentially the people here are looking after the lifts are also doing the inspections. So, you know, there's an inherent risk associated with that. And why was that not identified earlier? Uh, I know that now there's a separate regime in place now, but you know, surely that should have been identified as a key area of concern. Uh, MAHA have provided a service for the agency for, for quite some time under similar provisions within the contract. And I say they had subcontracted an independent um, uh, insurance assessor to do the thorough examination. So it was independent in that respect, albeit reporting through them through the contract. Uh, and up until uh, November uh, 2019, when the issues started to manifest, uh, we really had no issues with the service that was being provided and the plan preventative maintenance regime that was in place. It didn't, um, you know, escalate or wasn't causing us any concerns. Naturally, this is working equipment. It does need to be fixed. Bits need to be replaced and, and, and maintained as you would expect. But there was nothing to give us any forewarning that this was going to be the frontal, you know, issue we would face in the months thereafter. Um, so. I, I don't think that naturally the integrity of the contract uh, could be called into question, but suffice to say, um, we did take steps on the back end of the audit report to take the independent um, thorough examination inspection uh, in-house and, and DVA manage that directly through a separate contract. Thank you, Jeremy. And, you know, COVID-19 arrived um, in, well, as a result of the closure of the economy and society in around March of last year but if that hadn't happened and we all probably would wish that hadn't happened in terms of the devastating human impact that that's had uh, we would have had a significant disruption to MOT services um, across Northern Ireland for a significant period of time because of this issue this you know it was leading at the time to significant disruption and it would have continued uh, if not COVID-19 it came back uh, came and necessitated the closure of MOT centres um, and partially that was a result of, from my perspective, inadequate inspections that we came to a situation where the equipment was failing and needed to be replaced and the responsibility had been placed upon the supplier to carry out those inspections. Why was there no consideration taken in terms of legal action against the supplier for bringing DVA into the situation that they arrived in? I maybe pick that one up, um, Andrew, because it was a question I asked myself at the time and took very detailed both procurement and legal advice on. Now, obviously, for reasons of legal privilege, I can't get into the, the detail of the legal advice, but I can assure you that it was exceptionally carefully um, examined, challenged, revisited and reviewed really to see what options there were, what was actually in the best interest of getting, as you rightly say, the service back up and running as quickly as possible. Because at this point, we hadn't foreseen 
the devastation of COVID and the focus was on getting the, the service back up and running so that testing could re resume. But the, the combination of, of the very clear legal and procurement advice really took us into a position where we had a couple of choices, um, certainly within the department, um, and you know, ultimately, I'm the one that has to take responsibility for signing off on you know the continuation of buying new lifts from the same company. So it, it required a lot of questions on my part, but on the basis of the advice, really, um, we had very very few options if we wanted to get vehicle testing back up quickly and safely. Um, we couldn't have um, really avoided, and neither could the agency in terms of you know both testing and income, to have been dragged into protracted legal processes, which could have involved a company, and it could have then involved that company's um, subcontractors. And you know, you and I both know <laughs> legal processes can take a very very long time. So. The decision really was to get the services up and running with a legitimate um, contractual and procurement arrangement, and that is where we where we focused in in the department and in the agency. If it hadn't been for COVID, um, we would have had those lifts in place. Jeremy around sort of, I mean, April, May was the, the target, but you're absolutely right, Andrew, that would have been a huge amount of disruption over January, February, March, April, and, and there's no getting away from it because at that time we didn't know that, you know, the disruption would be an awful lot worse for a different reason. Yeah. yeah. Just one last question, Chair, because I'm conscious of time and there's other, um, other members that want to ask questions. In terms of the asset replacement plan, um, obviously, the, the, the disruption that's been caused as a result of this and also as a result of COVID add into DVA's reserves, and obviously there's been work in relation to that in recent times. But do you think there's lessons to be learned in terms of an asset replacement plan and having sufficient reserves for the replacement of these? or And uh, is that in place now going forward in the context of potential lifespans of the, the lifts that have been installed? Yeah, and maybe Jeremy will pick that up in a second. But from, from my perspective, um, I think one of the big lessons from this is the contingencies that you have in place when there is a wholesale failure. So the agency would always have had the reserves and the ability to replace equipment as it was needed to be replaced. Um, what wasn't foreseen was a situation where you, you had to replace everything at once. But at that point, the reserves were sufficient, Jeremy, to allow that to happen. And certainly it was the department's expectation that the agency would fund that replacement programme from its reserves. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, we had significant reserves at that point in time, and there was a significant, a significant amount of that set aside for the equipment replacement programme. And we awarded a new equipment replacement program in, in March 2017 uh, with a new supplier. And that uh, equipment will be first rolled out in the new Hyde Bank Centre. And coming back to a point Katrina made about the advice earlier on, I mean, that new equipment from that supplier has just actually been installed or is in the process of being installed at Corporation Street for performance testing. So there is no means that they could have provided a lift that would met our need at that point in time. Uh, which is why, after much consideration, uh, the procurement of the new lifts from from Maha was was the action taken forward. Um, so, I mean, there's there, the, the the equipment that we use has a bespoke uh, specification for DVA's use, and uh, you know it's important that that is rigorously tested before it's installed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, uh, Mr. McHugh. Mr. McHugh, okay, Mr. Boylan, <coughs> Mr. Boylan, can you hear us? Can you hear me, Chair? Chair? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, just two questions. Jeremy, tell me, um, when at what stage was the shaker uh, put on the lifts on these lifts? I mean, this is a straightforward house lift straight up and down and then there was a shaker plate put on for obviously checking the front suspensions and things when was, when was the shaker plate put on do you, do you have any indication of that 
I don't, uh, Cathal, off the top of my head, know exactly when the, the um, shakers were, or, or they're known as plate attackers, you know, so you can check the yeah. suspension and the components easier. I mean, our lifts have plate attackers both front and, and rear, certainly in the new design. Um, uh, but my understanding is, um, but I can come back to confirm, I believe that they were, the shakers in the, on, on those lifts would have been at the time they were installed back in between 2013 oh, yeah. and 2013. Yeah. Or no, 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 I only asked in the context, I mean, clearly, because when we went to visit the centres, I mean, clear, clearly the responsibility for the assessments and the checks lay with Maha. Is that right in terms of the inspections, the lifts? Yeah. Well, they would have been doing the sort of by you know by monthly the eight weekly inspections and then the thorough examination of the lifts for their integrity was carried out by the uh, the insurance uh, companies that they had contracted in. No, no, because I, I mean obviously because I'm in the infrastructure committee, we had an opportunity to go and visit. The, the reason why I asked about the shakers is because what you have and like I'm not an engineer, but I've been around the game for a while. So you had a straight lift that lifted houses straight up, and then you had a shaker plate on it and. Clearly, at some point there would have been some kind of stress on the on certain joints and thing. And I mean, obviously, I was explained this as part of once we we went to visit this thing. And I'm just trying to get down to those inspections because I still, to be honest, Germany and and thanks for the presentation today. Um, I am a wee bit concerned about the shelf life. Originally, in the chair, it picked up at the very start. I mean, because we're saying twenty two thousand, or we're talking about between five and fifteen years, whatever. I mean. Clearly, these things should have had a proper shelf life, you know, and should have been tested. Now, if, if you're saying that's, that's what it was, that's fair enough, because it's clearly been exposed otherwise. Um, that's, it's not, but, but do you reckon the shaker plates were put on from the very start, yeah? I, I understand um, that, that to be the case. Now, Cathal, I had a meeting with senior management from Maha last week, and I asked the same question, you know, in terms of the shaker plate design or the plate detector design, does that have a, a you know, an adverse impact on the structure, particularly the scissor arms? And their answer to that was no, that that would have been built into the sort of the the um, the specification of that lift, and they would have anticipated those like that load cycles would not be affected by the forces exerted on the frame by the shaker plates. So that would have been factored into the design of the lift. No, well, that's fair enough. And that's, I just asked the question that then you, you've answered in that context. J just the other one, obviously, in relation to surplus, the surplus position and current estimate surplus for it, uh, the end of March year 21. Can you give us a wee update on where you are at? And if there's a surplus, how will this surplus be used? <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad to report, Cathal, that the finance position is, is more positive than perhaps we um, previously reported at the committee in terms of we have been successful in the COVID bids that we have put forward, um, which were to a significant sum of approximately £31 million. Um, the majority of that would have been due to loss of fee income through, through vehicle testing, approximately £25 million of that indeed would have been um, due to the, the fees lost through the testing side. Um, so throughout the year, we put forward a number of bids, and in January monitoring round, we were successful in the outstanding 10 million bid and recovered uh, the COVID losses. Um, uh, in addition to that, the agency put forward a bid for non-COVID funding uh, recently to reinstate some of the reserves that had been removed from the trading fund back in 2008-2009, and we have um, successfully um, uh, in that bid of another 10 million pounds. So actually, the reserves position, um, or the anticipated reserves position at um, the end of this year is looking quite healthy. And that, uh, that uh, money has been earmarked as it was before uh, for the construction of the new test centre and depot at Hyde Bank for our ICT development and transformation and indeed vehicle testing equipment. And we need to have a sort of a working capital as well in around sort of six or seven million uh, so that we have enough money in the bank to run our business essentially in terms of income in and spend out. So we would always have that sort of six, seven million sitting there as working capital. Um, so the position, um, you know, is, is, is much improved from previously reported at the committee. Hey, thank you very much. And just on Katrina, welcome. Sorry, I didn't, I haven't, I haven't missed you there. Just at one point, I want to get a better better understand see in terms of the actual trading fund model can you just give me an overview of what that exactly is please 
Uh, absolutely, Cahill. Um, and it's, it's to my knowledge, and certainly Department of Finance officials can, can correct me if I'm wrong, I think the agency might be the only trading fund at the moment. So a trading fund is usually set up um, when an organisation has, has, has services that it could reasonably find for income. So you might remember the piece of legislation that would have gone through the Assembly in 2016 to set up the trading fund. That was probably mm. under the former Department of the Environment. Yeah. And since then, the agency has been running as a trading fund in line with the rules that are set out in managing public money. Um, it, as Jeremy says, has to set its fees to cover its cost. And it has to keep a level of, of capital, of working capital, so that it um, can can control its in, its its income and outgoings in a, in a managed way. And that's been the arrangement in place. I think prior to 2016, there was a mixed model where the former agency had some of its funding through income and some through general supply. And then the 2016 order regular regularized that into a full trading fund, and that remains the case at the moment. Of the insuring value for money, yeah. Abs well, absolutely, because there are there are restrictions to how a trading fund can operate. Um, so, for example, its fees have to, you know can't be um, way out of kilter with the costs of delivering the service. It has to, as Jeremy says, keep a level of working capital. But that's all very tightly prescribed in the various financial rules and regulations. And Jeremy's team and my own make sure that that's the case. Okay. Thank you very much, Katrina and Jeremy, and thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr McHugh, can you hear us okay? Hello, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, Fatcher Oval Leg, you're all very welcome. Uh, yeah, again, um, just I have a few issues in that. Uh, in and around the testing uh, and Maha, who were the people who were carrying out that testing, I'm sure that would have given rise to the way um, to you as an organisation, the very fact that they, they, in a sense, were testing their own equipment. I think, um, I mean, it's it's a really good point, Malicia, and it's one I've certainly asked. The the the, the requirements um, of the, and Jeremy can say a wee bit more about this, the, the regulations that govern lift, the lifting equipment are actually quite stringent. And these companies also have insurers who want to make sure that nothing goes wrong as well. So that combination of the company and then an independent um, inspector appointed by its insurance in, insurers should be a reasonable safeguard. But as you know, and as is set out very clearly in the reports, um, we would just be happier now with a, a further level of independent investigation and inspection, and that's the arrangement that's in place at the moment. Jeremy, you might want to add something to that. Uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, it wouldn't be uncommon to have a contract to, you know, supply, service, and maintain equipment. Uh, I suppose in some respects, it's much like you, you know, you buy a car and you take it back to the same people that provided the car to service it and maintain it for you. So, uh, Maha are obviously best placed to service and, and, and manage their own equipment. Uh, the one that, and again, was picked up in the report was about the independent insurance inspection. And uh, after further consideration, we believe that that was appropriate to take that and manage it ourselves, just so that we had, um, you know, ready access to that information, and that could be controlled and managed by DBA going forward, and to strengthen our own internal controls around the inspection. Right? But as Katrina says, I mean, they are strictly governed by the regulations, and um, you know, those LOLA regulations are applied right across uh, the board for anybody who has um, lifting equipment. They must be inspected in that six monthly regime. Yeah, we'll just continue and we'll say with uh, the uh, example that you use there with the car. Uh, I have a car that's uh, 16 year old uh, and uh, the mechanic that carries out the work in that is well aware of the fact that it's that age and he knows exactly where to look to for the weaknesses and that within it uh, before he submits it for an independent assessment, i.e. to the MOT centre. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the system that was uh, in the position uh, to date. Um, and I would say to the DVA themselves, in some respects, must be responsible in that uh, they themselves, while it's not accepting, would we'll say entirely that they didn't have a lifespan um, to each piece of equipment 
as such specified. Uh, but they did depreciate each and every year, we'll say, for that piece of equipment to the extent of whereby they were now uh, uh, valued at a pound uh, and each of the sets is not that they were located because clearly that depreciation period in itself must have implied that they would have thought that, well, by that stage, uh, that piece of equipment will have to be replaced so that, you know, uh, whilst we can identify that weakness in relation to the way that the machines that were maintained and the way that they were inspected, DBA themselves too uh, should have been a whole lot more rigorous uh, and the way they have applied themselves to uh, making a uh, replacement, say, for those machines. How would you feel about that? Uh, what, I, what I would say in response is that, you know, we had, uh, you know, a planned replacement program in terms of we, we knew that we were going to have to replace this equipment in our new test centres. We awarded a contract to the new equipment supplier in March 2017. Um, we sought further advice from our colleagues in uh, construction procurement delivery about how we would manage these lifts. Um, there was no expectation, and I, I, I think it's fair to say that it did catch us out that 51 out of 55 lifts exhibited these cracks. We didn't anticipate it. What we would have expected that some lifts might have um, gone out of service in that time, but we could have replaced them again within the body of the contract. And I suppose um, Maha, who uh, and the, the contract allowed for that. Maha, who were managing that contract, could have come to us at any time earlier than that to say that these, uh, you know, these lifts had reached their end of life. But going back, they did a condition survey for us at our request in October 2018, and that they said that these lifts were in good shape and could continue to be maintained and serviced by them. And we took assurances from that regime uh, that had been put in place, and indeed the condition report um, that they they endorsed that position. Well, as I say, and accepting those assurances that, if anything, implies the weakness in the whole system, given that there was 51 of them that were identified as uh, having the cracks and so on. But uh, I asked them to the further question that uh, Maha is still a contract at, uh, up until 2024, yeah? Uh, I think it's a contract that's over... That's right, yes. Yeah, it was over 12 million. Uh, and can you assure me that that particular contract uh, that has been subject to full procurement procedures? Yes, yeah, certainly the extension of that uh, contract, we would have engaged with CPD uh, around the integrity of extending it. And, and as I said, on the back end of some of the lessons learned from the uh, independent reports, we have taken some steps to add more rigour to it. We've removed the independent inspections, as I said. Um, we have reviewed some of the, the clauses to make it more accessible and clear about um, you know, uh, things that we can uh, go back to, to Maha from in terms of performance issues. Uh, but the one thing um, in terms that we've talked about is the, the life expectancy of these lifts that have been installed since uh, April and the, the final lifts were installed that were in Belfast. Um, Maha have assured that these lifts will be serviceable for four years. Now, that is the minimum position. Uh, we've also installed cycle counters in these lifts because we want to bring, uh, I suppose, more science to it to say, look, how can we assess what these lifts are actually doing? Because they're not lifting their full weight um, at, at all our centres. In fact, in many cases, they're lifting a small fraction of that weight. And we're working with Maha and their technicians to see if we can put in a formula that allows us to more accurately uh, assess the, the life expectancy of these lifts. And we'll probably use similar approach with our new supplier uh, to do the same when their lifts are installed in Hyde Bank and, and, and other places thereafter. Uh, and just finally, one, one last question. Uh, did anyone ever explore with Maha uh, in uh, relation to the poor and highly concerning quality uh, of the welding repairs that had taken place, uh, welding repairs that were identified by the TNA re-inspections? Well, well, we raised the issue. Um, the, the issue was um, picked up by the, the insurance inspection regime. And, and once they had highlighted a concern with the welded repairs, we immediately um, you know, went back and, and said, look, these lifts have to be you know, inspected before they could be re recommissioned. But it became quite quick, you know, clear and quite quickly that these uh, welded repairs were not going to suffice, uh, and, and as, a, as a result, the lifts were decommissioned. I'm sorry, I said uh, one last question, but definitely the final one this time. 
Was anyone else uh, considered at all uh, in terms of uh, this contract? In terms of the equipment replacement? Yeah. Um, for, for, I mean, I, I suppose it's back to Katrina's earlier point about the, the legal advice that was sought, and there was two a aspects of it. It was replacing the equipment, but also delivering the service, which was mm -hmm. fundamental. Um, and, you know, having sought that legal advice, the decision was taken that uh, we would procure lifts from Mahat with the intention of getting the service back up and running as quickly as we possibly could. But in terms of maintenance? And maintenance, well, the, the contract that Maha have with us is, a, you know, a supply and maintenance contract, and, and they service that equipment for us. So uh, it's it's not dissimilar to the new contract with the new provider worldwide. Uh, the contract is very similar in terms of uh, supply and maintain, and and we will uh, likewise strip out the independent insurance inspection out of that contract as well. Okay, that's gone. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Hello, and thanks for your uh, information to date. Uh, again, I would just like to go back on this issue of um, suddenly discovering multiple cracks on, on virtually every lift. Um, can you explain what in particular changed that suddenly all these cracks uh, were spotted? Was it the fact you wiped the, the, those inspecting wiped the grease away? What changed? Were the lifts dismantled? Were x-ray machines used? So what happened that you suddenly were able to discover 51 of the 55 lifts were faulty? I think once the first cracks, uh, and I said earlier, once they were discovered, it probably drew attention to the inspector to look out for these in a much more rigorous way across all the inspections carried out after that period of time. And I note that, you know, in the inspections that were carried out between July and October of the 35 lifts, there was no uh, cracks identified, but subsequently after the lifts, Cracks were identified in Lauren. There was, uh, you know, cracks identified in the further fifteen lifts. So, I mean, obviously, DBA staff were not responsible for the crack, you know, for the the inspection of the lifts, and and then that was, you know, through through Maha and then uh, the insurance inspector, and then once we asked them to do the fur, further thorough examinations, unfortunately, it manifested on on, on fifty one of the fifty five lifts that had, that had they had looked at, and we had to react, you know, very quickly at that stage. Can, can you clarify, were Maha carrying out inspections themselves or was an independent engineer uh, carrying out those inspections? The independent engineer carried out the inspections, but Maha themselves, um, once they were seeing the, the reports coming back, took it upon themselves to go out and look at these lifts themselves and carry a visual inspection, particularly around the areas of concern to see, um, you know, and they reported back. I think they reported back at that stage 48 of the lifts and it showed signs of cracking. Uh, and that's what really, you know, raised concerns. If that was at our request, they would do that. Sorry, I'm asking about the question about prior to the discovery of all the faults um, in the normal maintenance contract, was, which had been in place, was independent uh, uh, testing done, or was it Mahar engineers doing the uh, inspection? Well, Maha engineers, and they would have done the eight weekly inspections and the six monthly inspections carried out by the independent insurance inspector. You know, the third prior examinations of those, of those lifts under the Lawler regulations. Okay, okay. Now, in terms of um, the department, you would have quite a lot of uh, other equipment that would involve lifting. So I'm just thinking reassurance. Is it independently assessed or is it... Uh, perhaps inspect it in such a wet manner that there, there may be weaknesses there. So you're down to forklift tools to lift and tackle. So can you reassure me that all other lifting equipment within the department, and for that matter in other departments, is appropriately independently inspected? I can chair in relation to the department, and indeed it's a question I've asked, not just in the department itself, but for example at TransLink, which also relies on, on lifting equipment. Um, as Jeremy says, the Lawler regulations set out very specific legislative and regulatory requirements. I am absolutely assured that those requirements are met and continue to be met, and there should be no question of the law or regulations not being very scrupulously adhered to in relation to anything that comes within their purview across the department or indeed any of its agencies because you're right we work with you know big um and potentially risky equipment um just because of the nature of our business so that focus on on health and safety is actually hugely important to us 
Do you accept that this, this failure, as well as causing huge inconvenience to the public, uh, has cost the public purse significant amounts of money? It's certainly um, created a huge amount of disruption. Um, it certainly has meant that um, income that the agency would have been planning to use for other things, it had to divert to replace the lifts, for example, and meet the other costs absolutely associated with it. Um, in relation to the funding that Jeremy was talking about earlier, we've kept a very scrupulous divide between the costs for the agency that were related to the lift failures, um, which the agency is bearing on its own, and the COVID-related loss of income, which of course is a much wider issue and has hit um, public bodies um, right across the public sector and indeed bodies in the, in the private and third sector as well. Would you accept that mismanagement of this issue was the major contributing factor to the uh, DVA losses of almost three million pounds in the last financial year, whilst the replacement lifts only cost one point eight million. Surely that was a bad, a glaringly bad decision that highlights that public money was lost unnecessarily. There is no question about it, Roy. The, the, the lift failures have, you know, created a huge amount of disruption for customers for DVA staff, for the department, the minister and, and everybody else. In terms of, I mean, the question I ask myself most often is, where were the indications, that, did we miss any indications that this could have happened and could have been prevented? If I go back to the independent investigation report, it does make the point that it was actually reasonable for DVA to rely on the inspection regime that was prescribed in the Lawler regulations and um, on the assurances it was given. But it doesn't really help us that they found that because it still doesn't take away from the, the disruption um, and, as you rightly say, the costs that, that people um, have had to bear right across um, all of us affected. So. Yeah, it is. It is a question that I put to the auditors and to those carrying out the independent inspections. Where is the evidence? Did we miss evidence? Uh, was there, if you think about the the analogy of the dashboard, was there a red light blinking somewhere that we missed? It's really difficult to answer that question, other than with the entire benefit of of, of hindsight. Um, but there's no doubt about it. We should not have found ourselves in this position. It was hugely disruptive and. There's no getting away from that. You've said that the decisions made by the department and DVA around this have, have, were reasonable, yet uh, obviously your legal advice has not given you strong evidence to uh, sue, for, sue for, for losses. And you were, you were claiming legal privilege, but if you're not going to act on that legal advice, Surely it is not. It's, it is of no value. You've already taken a decision that you will not be uh, instigating legal action. Uh, so why can you not share that information uh, to this committee? Um, I think uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, just to assure you, we certainly were very strongly guided and informed by the legal advice, as you might accept, expect. There is a very long-standing privilege. If you go back to um, Erskine May and the Assembly's own arrangements that legal advice and legal opinion is always privileged. Uh, there are very good reasons for that, um, not necessarily related to this particular case, but related to the issue of, of convention and, and the issue of precedent. And I know that the committees and the assemblies, legal advisors, will be in a similar position to my own legal advisors, which you know is very firmly respectful of the convention that, that there is a very sacred space for legal advice and that the convention is that it is between it is confidential between the legal advisors and the client well, can you at least uh, acknowledge that there must be some criticism of dva or department within that advice or you would be suing um the legal advice is complex the procurement advice is complex the legal advice, um, I can't get into what it says, but I can absolutely assure you that it considered on balance the outcome that would happen if the department decided or the agency decided to take legal action. And 
the view we reached informed by that legal advice was that the public interest was on balance best served by trying to get the situation fixed as quickly as possible and not getting into what could potentially be a very, very protracted set of legal proceedings that would leave nobody in a position to do anything for maybe months or years. And I accept if you're not on strong grounds, you, you, you can throw good money after bad and cause, cause other difficulty. I understand that. Um, in terms of the high levels of reserves that the uh, department or the DDA is holding, um, in, in normal public bodies, you need to hold at least uh, a month's cash reserves just to, for normal running. Uh, if you have capital projects you have in mind, uh, you would need to have you know, money set aside for that. I'm trying to ascertain what is the reasonable level of reserves to you, for you to hold. Is £37 million too too high? Are your MOT charges too high? How, how do you justify the £37 million pounds of reserves? Uh, I think, Roy, in terms of the reserves, we had built that over a period of time because we knew we would have to invest not only in, in new centres but also in new equipment. And so that's built up um, over a, a period. Normally, our surplus position at the end of any given year would be somewhere in the region of three to four uh, million. And uh, I suppose if you factor that in against the amount of vehicle tests that we do uh, every year, um, you know, we do over a million tests a year, um, and the, the sort of standard car test fee is thirty pounds. So, it probably you know accounts for you know uh, four pound in the test fee that sort of contributes to the surplus position. But that is to be reinvested back into the agency so that we can ensure that we can deliver a service and modernise uh, our centres, modernise our equipment, and indeed uh, through our business transformation, ensure that our um, digital services are meeting and they, um, improving customer experience uh, as they deal with the agency going forward. So we have to reinvest um, some of that to make sure our service continues to be current. My question is how do you determine what is the right amount uh, and if you decide or if it comes out you've, you've uh, too much reserves, what action do you take? Um, how, how do you determine that £37 million is the right amount or is that just going to keep increasing? It's well, maybe worth um, picking up. You're absolutely right that any reserves have to have a basis for them. Um, and Jeremy has mentioned the um, new test centre and depot at Hyde Bank, the replacement of equipment on an ongoing basis, and I, also the IT system um, that the agency is in the process of transforming. So the costs associated with those projects alone would have come up to just below the working capital amount that the agency by, by its trading fund requirement is always required to keep. So well, yes, there would be a basis for building that up. Um, and Sorry, can you clarify those costs? The, the level of reserves that would be needed. Can, can you clarify the cost of those projects that you mentioned, please? Um, yes, so the, um, the Hyde Bank, the building of the new test centre, um, the development of the new IT systems, and that includes, Jeremy, the booking and rostering system, the general oh, provisions for replacements, um, and then your working capital fee. Have I got that, Jeremy? Broadly yes, right? that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, in terms of figures, Roy, I mean, we have uh, estimated the construction of the new test centre at Hyde Bank um, and the depot at around £18 million. The IC development costs uh, at four million, and the vehicle testing equipment um, at eleven million. Um, so those are the figures associated with those. But I hasten to add that these are estimate estimated figures um, in terms of that investment that we need to take uh, going forward. It seems to be reasonable plans ahead. So it looks as if we're not getting a drop in our MOT charges. Then um, just just one uh, final area of, of questioning then. Um, you had the right initial um, PFI contract, and then subsequently you've had um, maintenance uh, costs or contracts on an ongoing basis, four yearly basis. How do you determine the value for money or uh, good value? How do you set a reasonable cost to those maintenance contracts given that there's no competition? Well, uh, I think through, throughout any procurement of any contract, we seek advices from the you know the centre of, of expertise, in this case, construction procurement the director. Um, so our new contract for equipment replacement is a is a ten year contract, 
and obviously there has to be you know incentive commercial incentive to, to invest and what is a significant uh, investment on their behalf and also you know to maintain and service that equipment in time but in terms of all the contracts that um, we are taking forward we, we we do that through advices that we receive through uh, cpd endorsed by the business cases that we put forward through the department of finance so uh, they are all rigorously um, looked at um, from a value for money perspective when we go out to procurement and we follow the procurement guidance in that regard. And do you have a detailed breakdown of what um, uh, the reasonable cost will be for maintenance and uh, going forward, is there ever an opportunity for competition or if you extend, is it automatically going to that company because the original company supplied it, they have the expertise, they know how it's designed... Uh, is it open design system or is it simply going to be on a plate for everyone who installs it? I think, um, Roy, the, the contracts that the agency has at the moment are a good example of both. So we've talked about the steps that it had to take to replace the lifts that were put out of commission. And that was a case of going to the existing supplier, having, as, as we said before, tested all of the other options in relation to Hyde Bank actually that's a, that was a procurement that a different supplier won and it requires quite a bit of preparatory work and, and Jeremy mentioned some of that briefly, but just to reassure you, all of the procurement rules are followed. Um, our, our preference is always wherever we can without um, creating unnecessary risks that we would go for open procurement um, and then that the contracts are managed in line with um, all of the advice provided by central procurement people. Would you accept that if, if it's not an open design system, uh, you will not have created a situation where there can be competition in ever extending the contract? I think the, the, the key thing there is we, we have through the agency there are two different contracts um, already so the one for the new centre is not the same supplier as the one that we've been talking about for most of this hearing so that hopefully gives you some reassurance that you know open procurement is used and results in different outcomes. And has that, has that changed the maintenance cost going forward for that one centre? Jeremy, in terms of the, we're at very, very early days in terms of the um, equipment for the for the new centre, and it's maybe uh, maybe worth just saying we've about the, the preparatory work, um, yeah. which which also has had um, Roy its own COVID challenges as well. Yeah, I mean, Roy, I, I don't have the figures for of, of the the new contract co costs in front of me. Um, suffice to say, um, yes, we have just set up a, a new test lane at Corporation Street to start to rigorously test that equipment. Um, some eighteen months in advance of it being installed in Hyde Bank, the equipment that we have procured is from a Spanish company, and it had to come through the, its own sort of COVID rigor and quarantine rigor before it was delivered. Uh, it should have um, been with us in September last year, unfortunately. The COVID restrictions had delayed that, and equally, the the Spanish installers have, have been in quarantine for the last week or so, and have, have undertaken their COVID test. But they are now here to set up um, both the hardware and software and rigorously test that um, at our site in Corporation Street, uh, well in advance of that being installed at Hyde Bank, hopefully in September 2022. So yeah, I mean we have, uh, and, and they, these are these are big competitions um, at the time that. There was a lot of interest in that um, right across Europe. These are big companies that are bidding for these, so there's a very healthy competition. Um, we believe we got a very good um, bid through Worldwide, who are the new equipment providers. So there, there, there's definitely no issue in terms of the competition and the competitive uh, nature of supply of, of this equipment um, right across uh, across the world. There's a number of suppliers of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Hillage. Thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome this afternoon, folks. I'm not sure whether there's much more left to ask or not, but of the 51 lifts that were found to be damaged in some way or another, um, were they all put in at the same time? Were they all exactly they, the same age? They would have been put in between 2011 and 2013, I believe, and you know some of them will have experienced uh, different usage within that period of time. Uh, and I suppose one of the things that we have touched on today quite a bit is trying to identify 
you know, how do you assess the life expectancy of any lift or any piece of equipment once installed? And the reality is it is difficult. As I mentioned, the Maha director had indicated that lifts could last anywhere between five and 25 years, depending on their usage and depending on, on possibly what parts of the world that they are installed. So um, one, again, of the key lesson for us is how do we bring some further intelligence to that based on our own usage, based on the loads in the lift, and indeed um, looking a bit more rigorously about inspecting the metal, which give rise to fatigue issues, which ultimately took the, the, the lift out of service. So we're working very closely with, with Maha and will be with the new equipment provider to make sure that we can provide uh, a much better assessment of that going forward because we are very mindful that we have to manage public uh, money very carefully. We have to get value for money out of the equipment, but we clearly can't push it to the extent where that leaves us uh, in the position that we find ourselves in January, where it's a disruption to the service. So there is a fine balance, but we need to be assured going forward that we can get a much better calculation of that um, so that we are we are sure that this uh, equipment will serve us and serve us well. Yeah, you can see where I'm going, Germany. Some of this stuff was two years younger than other parts of it, but they all seem to be caught at the same time, which I know you're saying about different circumstances in each area, but to the lay person, that would look pretty suspicious looking back as to how it all got caught at the one time. Uh, but I do appreciate you addressing that point. Uh, on, on the contract, Stan, and the committee here have been looking at various contracts within the civil service over a period of time now, and we have found it rather alarming what, what does go on. Uh, obviously, this contract has been in place and renewed and extended on various occasions now through to 2024. I don't want to say the agency were asleep at the wheel, but was there a cosy relationship being developed amongst some of civil servants in your on your side of things in relation to the contract with Mahar? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. I think there's a lot of this was um, circumstantial uh, in terms of the planning for um, the you know equipment replacement program at large. I mean, we had um, taken work forward to as part of our business transformation program to look at the refresh of the network and the refresh of equipment. And unfortunately, that work had been developed to um, you know a very detailed stage. Uh, and unfortunately, you know at the point in time that the you know in 2017 that the assembly you know dissolved. And at that point in time, I don't believe that we uh, anticipated that that would have brought the institutions down for as long as it did. And throughout that time, we um, engage with uh, say CPD um, to say, look, what is the procurement strategy going forward here? How do we manage this? And our advices were always sought at that central, you know, procurement expertise unit, uh, and they provided us with guidance throughout around the extended time frames for the Maha contract and how we would manage that. And indeed, they can conducted a market signing exercise, you know, at a point in time, and you know there was limited interest in providing the service at that stage. So again, there was a lot of factors that played into the ultimate award of direct award contracts to Maha. But I would refute that this was. In any way, a cosy relationship. You know, Maha had certainly provided good service um, or satisfactory service throughout um, in terms of maintaining and servicing the equipment. Unfortunately, um, the January episode has, has, has left us uh, thinking about how we improve that going forward. And certainly, from Maha's own perspective, um, you know, there's there's obviously a reputational damage issue with them as well because they are a worldwide supplier of lifts um, to to many authorities. Okay, and maybe it's uh, worth maybe me ask, adding. I mean, you, the point you make is, is really valid. We know um, we faced issues around contract management across many departments before. Uh, one of the things that we had. Uh, Katrina, we seem to have lost you uh, in terms of sound. Um, I mean, I know. Yes, we you know. Yeah. Ah, right. I was. I don't know whether you got any of that, chair, but just by way of reassurance to the committee, um, because we know that there can be issues with contract management. The department's internal audit program for 2018-19, which was obviously just a few months before um, these these failures started to happen, included a specific internal audit looking at procurement 
contract and contract management monitoring and payments within the driver and vehicle agency. So because we know from experience uh, in other departments that there can be issues around contract management, we had subjected that very area in the agency to a very specific internal audit. Um, at that point, um, reassuringly, the auditors found um, their overall audit our opinion was satisfactory. And in fact, they had no priority one or priority two recommendations to make. So in terms of how contracts were being managed and monitored within the agency, that's the sort of thing I would certainly be looking for to give me assurance um, that cozy relationships weren't being developed and, and used to you know, the effect that, that we might be getting the best for the public out of them. Thank you. With that background, you said that the management had been surprised. I, I would have thought in January the management would have been shocked at the extent of it, to be honest, a wee bit shocked. Uh, I think uh, um, shocked, shocked is only one of many words. Uh, if you go back to the a bit context and surprised. as well, <laughs> um, you know, we, we had literally just taken delivery of a new executive and new ministers. This was not the second week that certainly I was planning for a brand new minister either. So oh, <laughs> you're no. absolutely right. Um, this was actually for for staff, for customers, um, for the agency. It was a hugely traumatic experience, the way it unfolded so quickly. OK. Well, just on the finances then, 25 million fees lost to COVID. Was there any specific figure for the loss to the this incident of the lifts? That's in the region of about three point nine million, um, Jeremy. I think if you have the figures maybe to hand. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, we we uh, estimated that there was two point nine five million loss to fee income between January and March in the immediate aftermath of the lift issues. And then, in the addition, there was cost in the region of just under a million for some of the uh, compensatory payments that were made to customers uh, who had their tests cancelled, uh, and other costs associated with the um, uh, the issuing of temporary exemption certificates. So, uh, in total, just just below four million was the cost that we had identified in twenty and uh, in, in 2019, 2020. Going forward, did I see somewhere there was going to be a reduction again of fees of fifty percent to? Customers somewhere along the line, would that be right? Um, I wonder is that the, the compensation arrangements, David, yeah. that the, the Minister put in place for the just the immediate weeks after the initial failure um, was 50% of your test fee, was the, okay. the compensation is that, is that period, the I wonder is that maybe? Is that in the 3.9 then, yeah? Yes, that was in yes, that was in the, the 3.9, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was there was approximately you know forty four thousand customers that um, received a compensation payment of uh, you know sixty sixteen pounds, which was you know half the fee mm -hmm. uh, over that period of time where we had identified disruption had occurred and the immediate aftermath of lifts being um, suspended. Customers were still uh, turning up the test centres and being turned away, and um, it was it was difficult to manage in that first few weeks. And there's no doubt. Um, there was a significant disruption at that stage, and that compensation payment is in line with the DBA's policy. Yeah, so, so that 25 million was was not just for COVID. Then that would have that COVID money would have covered your losses on the lifts as well. No, the the co cost of lifts and uh, Katrina made the point earlier. We were very clear that we separated, and the uh, cost of any of the lift, lift disruption was borne by the agency. The COVID money that we bid for was purely down to loss of fee income because of the COVID impact. So we didn't factor in any of the elements of the lift issues in terms of any COVID bids that were put forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, and finally, just a, a sort of a general question in relation to moving forward. And I know you have your own sort of capital projects coming up and whatnot stuff, but has it ever been looked at in relation to just bringing us into line with GB and maybe other places around Europe, whereby it, it's done by the private sector really and there's not this reliance on government to provide this facility? Yes, um, that was looked at in 2015-16 as part of um, a review of, of the arrangements for the agency. It's, it's, it's interesting that the GP model is actually the outlier in European terms because most European states have either a directly provided state testing regime or a state testing regime provided under contract. So the three options of um, 
entirely within government, um, contracted by government, or the English model were all looked at by the then Department of the Environment and the Department of Finance and Personnel, as was, and the public sector option was chosen as the, as the best way forward. Okay, and sorry, Chair, just how, how the HBA has really been where you see the problem within the whole setup? Is it that independent inspection that has given you the headache? Throwing both yourselves and Maha, of course. Uh, I would say, you know, the independent inspection regime is, is dictated by the regulations. It needs to be in place. Um, uh, we have, you know, HSB who were contracted to Maha how to do those inspections. Um, you know, they will reflect, I suppose, on the inspection regime. We have changed that now with a, a different supplier, as, as I've spoken about, but it is a fundamental part of the maintenance regime that we have in place and will remain so, and it's, it's consistent with other areas of the department. Um, you know, this is very clearly stipulated in the regulations about what needs to be done, and these are the experts. These, you know, these are um, the competent authority that provide us with the assurance that these lifts are okay. But as I've said earlier, we will work with the um, suppliers going forward to see if we can get a much more rigorous uh, assessment in terms of the vehicle lift life expectancy and indeed any other equipment that we use so that we're much better informed going forward. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Flynn? Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Jeremy and Katrina. Um, and I think almost every question that I had on the page has been asked in, in one sense or the other. Um, but um, thanks very much for all the detailed answers. Um, maybe just to come back to it, so the points being made by a few members, and Jeremy touched on it yourself as well in, in some of your responses, um, I think that it's, it's probably a given that the, there, there was an issue around the quality of the welding and also um, the quality of the, the checks and the inspections that were, that were being carried out. Um, and this might sound like a really obvious question, but it's one that just keeps coming to my mind as we're speaking. Um, so on the basis of the poor welds and the poor inspections, which obviously the responsibility or the work that was to be carried out from Maha, when um, disaster did strike, um, what explanation has Maha gave to yourself as the head of the, the DVA or indeed to Katrina as the, the, the head of the department? Uh, so I suppose in terms of the, the welding issue, Orla, I mean, really Maha were trying to, to assist the DVA in terms of ensuring that these lifts could be maintained um, for at least a short while until we had a, a plan in place. Uh, at that stage, you know, Maha were up front with us and said that these lifts, in their belief, had reached their end of life at that point in time, and that the welding repairs that they had suggested conducting were in an attempt to maintain a service for a short time until we could have had a slightly more planned uh, replacement, which wouldn't have had such disruption to our customers. Um, but, I mean, that was not um, widespread or indeed for long, it was always anticipated to be a, a short-term solution um, to, to address that concern at that point in time. Um, yes, there, there is no doubt we reflect and we have reflected quite significantly on what things, um, you know, and the lessons learned from, from the reports that had come out and the experiences which were very painful for staff and indeed the contractor themselves and indeed White Young Green who did the independent report um, it's important that we look up the, some of the, you know, the aspects of the inspection regime to make sure that they are properly covered and they have now been embedded in the inspection regimes going forward. There is a great focus on that part of the lift that uh, you know showed the cracks and, and ensuring that that now becomes embedded in our regimes going forward. Um, we, we we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. It had caused huge disruption and it's not an experience that any of us really want to live through again. I, I can assure you that. No, well, and thanks, Jeremy, and I suppose your, your response is interesting as well, because the issue around the, um, it's been quoted earlier on in the meeting around that, the problem around the welds and the quality and that, you know, that it was a poor quality and it was highly concerning. So I think that the fact that, you know, um, the welds were always going to be a sort of stopgap, you know, that it wasn't going to resolve the problem. Um, and I know you had referenced earlier on that you are even looking at, you know, the types of metal and stuff that's you know being used to you know to create the, the devices to, to begin with 
Um, so the second thing then, um, Jeremy, I'm just wondering, see with the, the maintenance schedule, so is it set by Maha or is it set by um, yourselves? And has the maintenance schedule then, how has that been modified or adopted to take into account the issues that you have been dealing with then over the, the past year or two? Uh, I suppose in simple answer, all of the question, um, the, 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 the maintenance regime is set within the contract of these uh, eight weekly inspections and the sixth month insurance uh, thorough examinations uh, and, and that fundamental process remains in place in terms of the, 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 the PPM regime that we have in place. Um, what some of the independent reports have highlighted to is um, drawing our attention to some of the elements of the lift that you to be um, you know more focused on in terms of those inspections, um, whether that's done by Maha through the eight weekly ones or indeed through the independent uh, insurance, and we have agreed sort of their processes from reporting um, all of those independent inspections through our own health and safety teams, through our contract teams, through our operations. So. There's uh, been internal uh, controls that have been put in place to ensure that everybody in the agency and the reports are coming out in a very timely way, that we have access to them, we can and, you know, interrogate those and raise any concerns at a much earlier stage. Um, again, a lot of those issues came out through the action plan that have been implemented uh, in the immediate aftermath of the lift, uh, of the lift issues. Um, so, I mean, the fundamental basis of the maintenance regime hasn't changed. It has been, uh, I suppose, refined, if, if that makes sense. Yep, no, it does, Jeremy. Thanks very much. And, and that just brings me on to my last point then, because I know that you've referenced um, the, the action plan a few times throughout the, the course of the conversation as well. And it's good to know that, you are, that that's well underway, um, th that piece of work. So maybe just finally, um, for, for Katrina, um, I wonder if you could provide an update on the current position um, from the department's perspective of the implementation of the recommendations, um, Katrina, from the report and how maybe you are getting on um, from that end. Yeah, thanks, Orla. Um, hugely important to me that those recommendations from both of the investigations were acted on by the agency. So the arrangement that we have put in place, and it's an interesting one because normally an agency would be expected to you know, get on with things, but because of the seriousness of what happened, um, the department needed a level of reassurance as well. So the system that we have in place is a, quite a detailed action plan. Um, both the minister and I were very, very keen that there would be absolute transparency. So we insist on the action plan being published. Jeremy provides through his audit committee to me. And then when I'm satisfied with it, it goes to the minister, a monthly report. And then every three months we publish a report. Um, for me, the additional safeguard is that, as well as Jeremy's audit committee, I have asked my departmental audit and risk assurance committee to scrutinise the action plan um, before the publication dates to make sure, particularly because you sometimes find when people are less steeped in things that they actually spot things and can ask um, better questions. So my audit committee has four independent members they scrutinise um, the report after it's been through Jeremy's uh, audit committee. And that just gives us an extra degree of, of assurance that those of us who spend a lot of time in this aren't you know, so steeped in it that we miss something very obvious. Um, and that then allows me to give the minister assurance on two fronts. First of all, that the actions that Jeremy and his team committed to are being taken forward. And secondly, that they're being taken forward in a way that actually will prevent this ever happening again. Um, and as a further safeguard, my internal audit team will be going in, um, is in actually at the moment in the agency, and will be reviewing the evidence behind um, every one of those actions. So if, if Jeremy and his team say that action's completed, then we look for evidence to say, you know, show me the evidence that it's completed. And that's just an additional safeguard to make sure that everything that the agency said it was going to do um, is being done. But the, the other part maybe worth mentioning is it would be unwise, I think, of me to think some of these things could only happen in the agency. So issues around the contract, um, issues that a couple of other members have already referred to around you know, health and safety issues, even in relation to records management, all of those now form part of 
the audit programme for the whole department because there's no point in le learning a lesson on the agency and then it not being picked up and, and learned elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, can, I, can I just ask, I mean, given, given that um, 51 of these 55 lifts were basically put out of use, um, it's fair to say if this was a private company, the DVA, and the DVA would have been closed, isn't it? In terms of the service disruption? In, in, terms, of, in terms of no service provided, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it was a sobering uh, decision to make. Um, it was the right decision to make for all the right reasons under health and safety grounds. But uh, I say we we need to look forward to, to ensure that the actions that we take forward um, make sure that this does not happen again. And um, you know, we placed huge reliance on the plan preventative maintenance regime, as we talked about, and the condition surveys that were carried out in those lifts. And that's the assurance what we now need to apply and we are applying for rigour to that regime to ensure that we have the confidence that those lifts uh, and indeed other testing equipment will be serviceable and not result in disruption to our overall uh, service delivery. I'm, 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 I'm pleased to hear, um, and you've said a number of times, Jeremy, through the meeting, that you're looking forward in terms of how you, how you look to the future around these things and that's, that's encouraging. But you have to understand the work of this committee is to look how we got to that point uh, in, in January of last year uh, as well and there are a number of crucial issues that I just wanted to explore with you before the, your evidence session comes to an end. In relation to, um, in relation to MOTs, are they equally distributed across the centres in Northern Ireland? In terms of the numbers carried yeah. out at each test centre? Yeah. No, um, some of the test centres are significantly larger than others. Right. Um, for example, you know, ours would be a significantly uh, large centre in terms of private uh, uh, goods, vehicles, and cars. Um, some centres have two heavy lanes. You know, there's a, a you know different size. I suppose we would classify them as small, medium, and large sites uh, across the province. Which, which in itself, I think, if as someone who worked in the private sector, leads you to wonder why 51 out of 55 have to be replaced whenever that is not equally distributed across those centres. I mean. Um, Am I right in saying that Maha were appointed because, because of the product they produced and installed? They were appointed. Did the, the, the maintenance come as part of the contract when the products, when the, the lifts were bought initially in 2011 and 13? Yes, I believe so. Um, in terms of the supply and maintenance of the contract, was you know goes hand in hand, um, uh, and they service that uh, for us. I mean, in terms of the um, talking about the distribution of MOTs, I mean some test centres have fewer lanes, but um, it's very difficult to be exact in terms of the the, the amount of um, lift cycles each lift and every centre makes, and uh, so that's why we're investing in the lift cycle counters so that we get a better uh, sense of that. We yeah. certainly have figures for each test centre in terms of how many vehicles go through each centre, but um, that extra bit of uh, management information will certainly help um, our planning going forward in terms of uh, doing an accurate assessment of, of, of uh, the vehicle equipment. Yeah, given, given, just, before, I'll come on to that in a moment, but in terms of Maha, was that initial contract for maintenance, uh, was that for the entire lifespan of these lifts or was it for one or two years, three years, five years, whatever? How long was that for? It would have been for the duration of the contract, okay. um, and that contract has, has obviously been extended since and is currently in place until the 31st of March 2014. So, so the maintenance uh, and the, the, the reliance in terms of maintenance uh, of information in terms of the number, numbers of cars being tested, the, the type of vehicles being tested, the, the quantities, uh, the tonnages, all crucial to the maintenance, and we weren't keeping a record of those in the DVA. Well, uh, as I say, the planned preventative maintenance regime that was put in place was the, the reliance we took. Katrina has um, made mention of, of some of the internal audit reports in terms of the management of the contract didn't flag any issues, and at no point in time would management and DVA have been aware that this significant uh, problem was about to manifest itself and indeed so quickly uh, based on the condition reports and the, uh, the outcomes of the inspections that have been conducted up at the lab point. But given the nature of these products and the fact that they have to carry a certain number of tests each year and tonnages critical to that, failure to keep those records 
was an indictment of the DVA, I have to say, and, and ultimately led to the situation that unfolded. Um, in terms of the, the new um, machinery that's put in place now, the new lifts, um, are Maha doing the maintenance for that as well? And again, is that a fixed contract for, or is it time bound? Yes, Maha have the current contract for the lifts that are installed in our test centres and they will maintain that equipment for us up until uh, March 2024. And the new equipment provider will then supply equipment to our new test centre and Hyde Bank, and there will be a rollout of equipment, uh, you know, thereafter once the Maha contract, um, you know, is uh, you know expires. Um, so the the worldwide equipment contract will kick in, and uh, they will be responsible for the future replacement of all equipment across our test centres, and indeed the maintenance of that equipment. And you you have confidence in them carrying out those those maintenance tests and. Oh, on an, again, I suppose, still on an eight-week basis, yeah? Yes, we have confidence with the, the regime, and again, the actions that have been put in place following the lessons learned, uh, we believe, has strengthened the internal controls and bring more rigour to it. The uh, application of the cycle counters, the management of those counters, and again, the point that you make, can we assess the load of the vehicle on the counters we're, we're working with, Maha, to see if that is feasible with the software that they have introduced. We will also be looking at other aspects of how we can test the integrity of the very um, elements of the lift that uh, caused the problem in terms of the metal fatigue. So those are all areas that we will be looking to take forward to give us absolute assurance of the and a, and a more accurate estimation of the lifespan of these lifts going forward, and indeed with the with the new equipment to pro provider. It's just that in answer to an earlier question I asked, you talked about bringing in a competent authority to carry out. Um, tests whenever they, whenever the, the faults manifested themselves at the start, you know that's over and above. That was a subcontractor that was brought in by Maha to carry out work, because clearly Maha weren't up to doing that work. That's well, the competent authority is the the insurance inspection. They are the ones that carry out the inspections under the roller regulations, and okay. that remains the case, albeit that that. Um, a thorough examination by the competent authority comes back to you know back to DVA. Now we manage that contract separately. That contract I think was put in place in the first of May 2020. So well, that is coming back to us now. And they're the competent authority in terms of they're the ones, they're the engineers, they understand the equipment. Um, that's not a service that we could have um, brought in house. So uh, we have the contract in place for that to be taken forward, and that will be uh, you know also the case with 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 the new contract. So. So the, in, the insurance company, uh, I think I picked up earlier on, Jeremy, the insurance company, uh, they had a, a test carried out twice a year, is that right? Yeah, it's a six monthly inspection, yeah. And none of their tests in the run up to this debacle revealed these, these um, fissures in the machinery? No, that's correct. Uh, there was no indication that this was, uh, you know, there will have been issues of, of that, I have no doubt. Um, with equipment that would have needed to be repaired, but not uh, an indication of this okay. uh, wider spread issue. And so some of these, these tests could have been carried out weeks before these things manifested themselves. And these competent people, this competent authority, their, their um, inspections never revealed that there were 51 faults out of 55 lifts. No? It, it, did, not, it did not manifest itself through those previous inspections, and I say, um, uh, right up until the, the first cracks were identified in March. It was really only after that that um, the, the, the issue unravelled. Given that these lifts were lifespan between 5 and 25 years, um, uh, and given that there was a not an equal distribution across all of these centres in terms of the number of cars and the tonnages then, why was there not a phased replacement of these lifts? Some of them were, were installed in 2011, some in 2013. In any private company, you would install them over the lifespan and write them off over that number of years. Why was that not done by the DVA? Well, uh, I suppose it goes back to the, the wider issue in terms of our plans to upgrade the network and replace equipment. And I say we had plans at an advanced stage um, uh, taken forward that piece of work um, back in, uh, at the end of 2016. Um, and I say, uh, unfortunately, with the um, uh, assembly, um, you know, collapsing at that point in time, we didn't get um, you know the final sort of funding approval for that piece of work to be taken forward. Um, that said, we had uh, a plan to replace equipment, and at that point in time, we had to go back to um, you know construction 
um, and procurement uh, division to, to ask, you know, look, what is their, their, their plan, you know, what would they suggest is, you know, is how we take this forward um, to manage the lifts for the, the remainder of the contract. But, but, and, um, but, but, uh, and, and essentially that advice that we took from them was that, you know, we continue to manage it um, under the maintenance regime and we would replace what the contract provided us for if there was any of those lifts um, needed replaced during that time. We, what we didn't expect is that all the lifts would um, manifest themselves with the same fault at the same time and need to be replaced, which had such a, uh, an impact on our service delivery. But, but actually, Jeremy, your answer is strengthening my point. There should have been a phased replacement of these, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot blame this. Had this happened at the beginning of 2018, for example, uh, when there were no ministers in place, uh, the permanent secretary would have had to make a decision. Uh, or the Secretary of State would have had to make a decision because we would have a situation where 51 out of 55 lifts weren't operating and MOTs not being uh, carried out in Northern Ireland. You know, I've heard many things being used, or the, the, the collapse of the institutions here being used as an excuse for many things, but not the replacement of lifts in MOT centres, I have to say. And, and I do think one of the things going forward, I'm amazed that there wasn't a phased replacement scheme because that's exactly what should have been happening and that should be in place going forward. In terms of DVA's reserves, what were the, re the reserves prior to what happened uh, last year? 35 million, is that right? The reserves um, as of the uh, 1st of April uh, 2020 were 37.8 million. Okay, and, and, and what, given, what monies did you get during the year then, throughout the year from the Department of Finance you know, whether COVID or other monies, how much did you get? Well, we got um, uh, approximately 30 point, um, or 31 million through COVID funding, and that was to, due to a loss of fee income, um, primarily because of vehicle testing, but also driving tests and some other other um, other smaller elements. Um, so we got uh, 31 million through the COVID funding, and then we got an extra 10 million uh, through non-COVID funding. And that was to, as I replenish reserves that had been removed okay. from the agency back in 2008-2009. So, um, so we got an additional 10 million through so for, for, the for, for, of those reserves. 41 million on top of reserves that were 37.8 million. No, so, because we had we, we had lost. Uh, you know that was to you know the the reserves had been drawn down because of the loss of fee income coming in. Yeah, yeah. Coming, those, okay, so. coming to that. What was the overall loss then in terms of your fees? What was that? The overall loss. Well, we estimated the loss of income for from fees at thirty, just under thirty-one million. Right. And that was the bid that we had put forward in terms of the estimates. Now, I hasten to say that they are estimates, and we'll not know um, the actual impact of that until we finalise our accounts, which will be completed in, in, in around June time. Okay. So you had thirty-seven point eight. You got thirty-one million plus another ten million, and you lost thirty-one million um, in terms of lo lack of loss of income coming in through fees and whatever, yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah. So for the investment of £1.8 million, the public purse of Northern Ireland lost £31 million. And given across the Department of Infrastructure, the pressures that, for example, TransLink are in, in terms of buses and trains, £31 million would go some way to replacing rolling stock and fleet. The, um, I wonder if just it's worth just clarifying the distinction because the, the thirty one million pounds relates only to COVID. Um, so the thirty one million pounds relates to the income lost as a result of COVID. As as Jeremy said quite rightly earlier, the agency kept on the department required it to keep completely distinct the losses due to the lift failures um, to make sure that they weren't in any way muddying the waters in relation to COVID. Okay. So in relation to 31 million, that's the loss due to COVID, not the loss due to the lift failures. And what, and what was the loss to the lift failure then? Well, the loss of the lifts um, was indicated at 2.95 million between January and March 2020. Yes. And then there was another just under a million pound, which I explained earlier around sort of compensation payments and the management of the temporary exemption certificate process. So, so close to 4 million? Close to 4 million, yeah. Okay. In 2019 uh, uh, 2020, yeah. Okay. Um, Katina, can I just ask you said you have your own audit committee, is that right? That's right, yes. So, and you have four independents in that audit committee? Yeah. 
Uh, who are that uh, audit committee? Who, what is the makeup of that, and how are those independents appointed? The um, in common with all government departments, there's there, there's two different types of members. So all departments have one or two independent board members who sit on their departmental board, and they're appointed through um, an open competition. So um, the two members, the chair and one of the members of my audit committee, were appointed um, to the departmental board through open competition. Other, most other departments have one other man, member who generally comes from another government department but with an accounting background. In our case, um, we had some very, very good quality interest and we took the decision to appoint not one but two. So I have two members appointed through an, uh, an external recruitment process and two members who are people from other departments in the civil service, and that would be the common model across all departments. Yeah, could, could perhaps you furnish the clerk with the, the names of those people, if you wouldn't mind? Yes, certainly. Um, um, that's no difficulty and, at all. And, and, and the, the final point I would make is, we are, I think, as a committee, disappointed at the failure to see the legal advice. Um, I, I accept the point you were making earlier on about precedent and um, so on, but in terms of openness and transparency, and um, I, I would have thought that in the, in the current context it would have been good to see that, but we are where we are. Well, look, unless any other member has any other question, um, I think that concludes this session, and uh, I would thank um, Katrina and Jeremy for their their time with us this afternoon and their candour in answering questions. Thank you both very much indeed. Okay. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, members. Um, so at this stage, um, Mr Donnelly and um, Mr Stevenson, um, are there any points you would like to make before uh, our, our guests leave us from, from your perspective? Uh, no, not. Okay. Okay. Not, okay. Um, thank you very much. Broadcasting, Mr. Ms. Godfrey and Mr. Logan will be leaving the meeting. Um, Mr. Stevenson will also leave the meeting. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, and um, members, we will now go into closed session to further discuss the evidence session. The audit uh, office team will remain. Uh, members you, uh, who are in spotlight, um, if you wish to speak, please unmute yourself uh, and indicate. So we're now going into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.